Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 99. And today we are switching back into true crime mode. We are going to be talking about the case of Deborah Newell and John Meehan. Yes. And this is a crazy case. Oh, my God. There is a Netflix series about it called Dirty John. So you also may have heard of it as the Dirty John case. And there is also a podcast. Yes. Uh, so, a really good podcast on yes, it. Yes. But, you know, we're going to be doing one episode. They did like a ton of episodes. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to take try to take all the information, compact it into one podcast about this absolutely crazy case. Yes. And it's it's really insane. I think you guys will be pretty fascinated by how all this happened and kind oh, yeah. of blown away. It'll make you question people that you meet. Oh, yes. For sure. <laughs> Very much so. But we are in the new year, 2020, and yes. we've got a lot of exciting things coming this year. Yes, we do. We have been working very hard to get our new studio done. For those of you that watch on yeah. YouTube, you know we've been in front of the green screen for way longer than I ever yes. anticipated. We've um, had so many complications. Setbacks I mean, and just... Building a small building is more yeah, work we, than you would think. We Yeah, that's exactly what we did. We built a small building and completely finished the outside and inside and yeah. it took a lot longer than i thought yep we had a lot of setbacks with permits and getting it approved that took a while and then recently we decided we're going to have to put a ceiling in we were going to have just exposed wood on the top but we won't be able to keep it warm enough yeah, or cool way enough too cold especially and, here in colorado yeah. it gets icy at night and so. it's like we can deal with that we could bundle up but we don't want our guests to be like freezing like <laughs> oh my god i can't even be yeah. on their podcast it's so damn cold yeah exactly so we decided to put the ceiling in and that set us back another couple of weeks but next episode we will be in the studio but we do have to take a short break from the podcast until the studio is ready and because we're working on another project right now right which i'm really excited to kind of talk about here for a second yeah, no, it's it's something that we're very proud of and mm -hmm. has required a ton of work. And this is yes. something that we partnered up together mm -hmm. on. This is going to be something for my channel, but it's something that we are collaborating on. And this is something that we'll be doing a lot more in the future as well. This is the start of Mile Higher Productions. Yes. So um, I guess you can call it, we are, we're calling it a vlogumentary, a true crime vlogumentary. Yes. Um, it's long. It's a huge case. We tackled a giant case for our first shot at this, yes. but um, I'm really excited to see what you guys think of it. It's just been a huge challenge for me. I've never done anything like this in my whatever Neither seven years I. I mean, I've done YouTube. <laughs> I never thought I'd even yeah. be podcasting at all. So right. this yeah. has all just been a trip for me, but I'm yeah, really we, excited. We traveled for this. We have hours and hours and hours of footage and we just, it's a whole thing. And taking a lot longer than we even thought. So we wanted to focus the next two weeks on that, getting the studio done right. so that we're ready and we don't have to delay this project at all because it's just, I need help from Josh. It's so much work. We just want to make sure that we give ourselves adequate time to finish this project we're working on, plus mm -hmm. get episode 100 ready to go for you guys, as well as get the studio ready because I have a bunch of new equipment I'm adding to it. The setup's going to be completely different and a lot better. I think yeah. it's going to be very visually appealing to you guys. Yeah, we're taking it up a notch and we just need time to get everything ready and making sure that this project is good to go because, right. you know, we're working with a family. We want to make sure we make it just perfect. We don't want to rush and I just need more, you know, help. Yeah, so. exactly. So this will be the last episode until the week of January 27th is when episode 100 in this new mm -hmm. studio will come out. Mm -hmm. So until then, you got Dirty John to listen to, and yeah. this is a, it's a big one. Yeah. Or you can go back and listen to our old episodes if you're new to the podcast. How many of you have listened to every single one? Are there that many of you out there? Yeah, I know. I'd love to know. I can't imagine. A hundred that at That's an hour a, a piece at least. Damn. I mean, I've never committed to anything <laughs> like yeah. that. So if no, you I'm, have, good for you. Yeah, seriously. Because we've talked a lot. Yeah, we talked a lot. And thank you. Yes, thank you. So that was our little uh, mile heart update for you guys. But let's go ahead and get into the episode here. Our sponsors for today are Candid, Third Love, Upstart, and Postmates. Yes. Thank you, guys. And our first new story is kind of an update from yes. our last episode because there's been this crazy kind of phenomenon going on in Colorado and, and parts of Nebraska with drone sightings. And more information is starting to come out about this because... More and more people are seeing them, and now law enforcement's gotten involved trying mm -hmm. to identify these unknown drones that are flying around at night. There's a anywhere from like five to sometimes 
10, 20, 30 even people have reported. And they're all pretty close together sometimes, like a yeah, flock of yeah. birds almost. It's very, it's very weird. And they're doing like grid groups. patterns and stuff. So there's been a lot of speculation about who is flying these drones. And these aren't, and what we're learning is that these aren't like your typical like hobbyist drones. Like right. I have I have a couple drones and they're like really small and mm -hmm. compact. But these, that's what I thought these were. Too. Yeah. Well, that's what most of us thought. Because when you think of a drone, you now think of like the little ones that we fly. Mm -hmm. But these are huge drones, like yeah. six to eight feet wingspan. Like they wow. actually have wings on them. It's hard to get an idea from the pictures. There is no pictures of them. That's the thing is because they're flying around at night, there's only lights. There's only like little lights in the sky. Oh, we right. don't even really know based upon the lights. You know, we're guesstimating that right. it's six to eight feet, but mm -hmm. we don't even know what kind of drones these are. And people have been trying to chase them down. Like people said that they were driving like 70 miles an hour after a drone as it was flying away, but they're, that's crazy. They're extremely fast. So theories have started kind of to swirl about what's going on and you know, who owns these drones and, and who's piloting them. Cause it's kind of starting to weird people out. I mean, I, I can only imagine wondering too, if I went out in my backyard and mm -hmm. looked up at the sky and I saw a bunch of like lights flying around. And I mean, honestly, I'm surprised people aren't, thinking that these are ufos you know so oh totally i think there's a lot of people that actually are yeah. or they think they're being controlled by ufos or it's something well, paranormal in some way maybe. there's something going on because no one has come forward so far to claim that these are their drones or that's what's weird mm -hmm, that's yeah exactly that's the mystery behind all of it it's but, like if you were doing something or running some type of mapping like a lot of people brought up mapping yes. to us which could companies. make sense and somebody said that well maybe that they fly them at night because there's not as many people out. So they hope not to like freak people out because during the day you could see them a lot mm -hmm. better during the day. Well, then why aren't they just clearing this up? Yeah, exactly. You know, like that's if the, the police are involved and it's become an investigation, that's kind of like. Well, yeah, and that's exactly what it is. The FAA is open an investigation. Multiple law enforcement agencies have opened investigations and they're trying to figure out what's going on with them. And they've gone and asked everybody, including the military, uh, the Air Force, if if it's them doing anything, and everybody has denied knowing anything wow. about these drones. Interesting. But this team, uh, this past week, a team of experts actually started looking at this, and they've kind of all come to this consensus that these drones are some type of military uh, drones. They think it's associated with some type of either military contractor or it's a top secret project type thing mm -hmm. that the Air Force might be doing or some other agency or branch might be be doing that is not supposed to be disclosed to the public that can very well be what it is but when you start thinking about it, you're like what are they doing are they just testing out new technology yeah, or are they there? actually like doing something actively like reconnaissance or mapping like what is going on because it, it is very very bizarre why do they need up to 30 sometimes i don't know like at one time how different could the shots be from drone to drone it doesn't make any sense and it's varying sizes it sounds like so it's weird. it's very very weird and yeah nobody's claimed that these are their, their drones yet which is very bizarre mm -hmm. and i mean this has gone all the way up to like the senators colorado the yeah. government's getting involved cory gardner people are trying to figure out what's going on because these highly advanced drones are unknown yeah to anybody Corey Gardner said, I've been in contact with the FAA regarding the heavy drone activity in Eastern Colorado, and I'm encouraged that they've opened a full investigation to learn the source and purpose of the drones. I will continually close, I will continue to closely monitor the situation. So yeah, it's becoming a big deal. It's, it really is. That's People are starting to get really kind of irked about it, honestly. Weird. It's just so odd. Mm-hmm. Welcome to 2020 with flocks of drones I just know. flying around in the sky. It's not like 2020 has already been a crazy enough year already. And the most bizarre oh God, things have I been know. happening, I feel like. I know. With this drone thing and everything else happening in the world has just I been know. so crazy lately. And then we also wanted to give you guys an update on Australia and the fires going on there, which have been just out of control. We've talked about it the last two weeks, but it's gotten way worse this week than even the previous weeks. I mean, it's just not seeming to slow down at all. It's no, super scary. No. And every like this week especially we saw some new footage out of yeah. out of there of firefighters driving through the forest and just everything around them is engulfed in flames and people on the beaches evacuated right. because their towns literally surrounded by these bushfires. It's absolutely insane. They have nowhere else to go but some of them into the water. 
yeah, and blood red skies. Like it's the middle of the day, mm -hmm. and the sky is completely like blood red yep. and dark. It looks so Terrifying. ominous and scary out there. I know, and you know, being in this age of social media where people can share what's going on, you know, you almost feel like you're there seeing all these. Yeah, you really do stories, and you, you know, really do. Pictures. I think that's a great point. Like which is good because it helps more people care hopefully yeah i think it helps raise awareness and yeah i'm raising seriousness i mean once you see something visually it makes more of an impact on you for sure what's crazy to me that a lot of people i think have shared this thought is that why is it that so many wealthy people donated money to the notre dame fire which is a building mm -hmm. and it seems like those people are nowhere to be found when something truly devastating like these bushfires in australia yeah i mean it seems like there's been an increase in donations across the board this week but yeah i agree I mean, i'm talking about like wealthy billionaires i i know and i mean it's people that don't or maybe they do understand they just don't care but it's ridiculous to have a building be more important i understand that they it's an important building it's a it's, landmark yeah, yeah it makes sense but right and it should be cared about but the fires should be at least equal with it as far as concern across the board and it's not um, but I've definitely seen a huge spike in people talking about it, yeah, especially on social yeah. media in the last couple of days. Yeah, it's definitely grown quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and the we're awareness. Starting to see, yeah, more people making donations and, yep. and doing the right thing. So the majority of the fires, I mean, there's fires all over Australia, but mm -hmm. New South Wales, the state of New South Wales is just almost oh, consumed yeah. by fire. It's actually insane. It's there's scary about 150 fires burning there yeah it's pretty just mind-blowing if you think about how mm -hmm. much space is burning just yeah. there so with over 150 fires burning they've had to deploy two to three thousand firefighters but even so much even with that amount of people they can't tackle all the fires around the entire country no there's only so much we can do to put these out i mean they're just massive and there's more of them starting they think that all these the fires are going to burn far into 2022 that's so because insane. the dry season is just kind of kicking off since like yeah. september and it goes for a while it's so. spreading like crazy we're losing so many animals and we're going to continue to just lose mass amounts of animals and i think australia is one of those countries where the amount of animals that only exist in australia is yep the percentage is really high mm -hmm. so when they're losing that mm -hmm. amount of animals and species it's really having a huge effect like mm -hmm. species could potentially go extinct yes if this continues oh they will there will be some species that go extinct there's some that are hanging on by a thread mm -hmm. you know that are just barely surviving that are pretty much already extinct that they're gonna lose in the fires yeah and it's like that and between that and the coral reefs right now that are just dying it's really a horrible state to see australia in to see our planet in it's so sad. It's a gorgeous country. Josh and I have been there. We loved it there. And yeah. it's just heartbreaking to see it these really images is. of such a beautiful, almost like heavenly place. It is it a really is. beautiful place. It's a magical land for it sure. It is. And this is just devastating. The people there are so good. And it's just heartbreaking to think about the devastation. And it's it makes you feel really helpless, I think, reading about it. That's how it makes me feel. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes me want to drop everything and, and fly over there and try to help and start fighting fires. It's just crazy. And I mean, I feel like countries around the world and governments around the world need to wake up and like yes. assist a little Send bit better. Send more international aid, 100%. Like the U.S. only sent like 150 firefighters over there. It's like, do they not realize that this is going to affect the whole planet? Like this is, this is the effects of climate change too. You mm -hmm. know, this isn't just... Because. Yeah, and this is something that is only going to continue into the yes. future. Like we're going to face more of this. I mean, we already saw it with the California wildfires this mm -hmm. past year. Those are those were extremely bad, and it's only going to get Terrifying. worse from here. So mm -hmm. we got to start taking the shit seriously because mm -hmm. it's it's really going to get out of control. And you know, we're all going to be experiencing something like what Australia is. It's it's insane. And I mean, my biggest beef is like, why is our government, you know, more focused on sending thousands of troops to the Middle East to, you know, deal with that whole situation when, you know, we should be sending people to Australia to help them with the fires and stuff. Mm -hmm. It just, it's our priorities are so wrong and messed up in my opinion. Like I think there should be more done to help, especially a country like Australia. Mm -hmm. 
I agree. And it's just not happening. So if you are able to make a donation, I definitely would. Uh, we will leave a couple of um, places that we donated to yeah. or places that we think are good that you can feel confident about giving your money to uh, if you want to help out. Um, they really need it more than ever. And like we said, this is going to continue into 2020. So if you can't donate now, maybe you can donate in a month from now. It'll still make a difference. They're going to need help for a while and they're going to need a time. lot of help. A lot of resources, uh, it's supplies. It's a huge mess and just a tragedy. I think it was just declared a disaster actually. So it's just terrible what's happening there. And we really feel for everyone that, yeah. it, you know, listens that is from Australia. You know, we know we have a small amount of our audience that is from Australia and we, we feel, feel for, for you guys. guys. Yeah. We're worried about you guys. We're thinking of you guys, but Australians are strong people. They are. They will get through this. Absolutely. They will. Yeah. This is, they will definitely prevail. They're tough. Mm -hmm. Tough as hell. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into the dirty John case. But before we do, we'd like to thank our first sponsors for today. If you wear bras, you have got to check out Third Love. It has become one of my favorite brands over the years, and, and it's something that I believe that everyone with boobs should check out. They believe that every woman deserves to feel comfortable and confident every day. And with the right kind of support, they can help you do that. Their bras are designed to fit you, not the other way around. They're designed with measurements from millions of women, and their bra styles are made to fit your life. They have over 80 different bra sizes, but they know that only one really matters to you, and that is yours. So they have a fit finder quiz that helps you figure out what size you really are, and you might be surprised when you find out that you're not exactly what you thought you were. I mean, it was a big surprise to me finding out that I was a whole cup off from the bra size I was wearing. Every bra is made for your comfort with memory foam cups, no slip straps, and a smooth scratch-free band with a printed label. And they believe in giving back because they donate all of their gently used bras to women in need. So if you try the bra out and you don't really like it or you want to try a different one, you can send it back to them, no questions asked, and they will donate it to someone who needs it. Third Love knows that there's a perfect bra out there for everyone. So today they are offering our listeners 15% off their purchase. All you got to do is go to thirdlove.com slash mile higher and you'll be able to find your fit today and get 15% off your purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mile higher for 15% off today. Between hitting the gym, eating cleaner, or learning a new skill, there's a lot of ways we can better ourselves in the new year. But I can't think of one that's more important than starting off the year tackling high interest credit card debt. My friends at upstart.com are here to help. Upstart is the revolutionary lending platform that offers smarter rates, to help you pay off high interest credit card debt. Upstart goes beyond the traditional credit score when assessing your credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter rate. Upstart believes you're more than just your credit score. They believe in you. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate. Since it's just a soft pull, it won't affect your credit score. The hard pull happens if you accept the rate. The best part, once the loan is approved and accepted, most people get their funds the very next business day. The next day, guys. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. All right, now let's get into our main topic for today. And that is the case of Deborah Newell and John Meehan. Yes. Otherwise known as the Dirty John case. Yes. And there is a series on Netflix about it, but it is not like a documentary, which is interesting because I don't think we've ever covered a case that was made into like a dramatic series like this. Reenactment type thing, yeah. I, but, I've covered cases like that, like the Dee Dee and Gypsy case was, yeah, right, you know, right. reenacted. And I normally don't like that type of stuff. I'm not a big fan of reenactments and like shows that have taken stories, but this one was okay. It was all right. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, it, it definitely tells the story somewhat but there's a lot of details that it leaves out for sure yeah. and some that was dramatized or like you know just added in because it makes a good hollywood production right, right. and yeah 
I tend to like, I'm like, eh, but I don't know. This one was pretty good. Um, the acting was eh, meh. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like they portrayed some of some of things just wrong. But um, it's a good a good thing to pair with listening to the podcast. Yeah, because the podcast obviously goes into immense detail about mm-hmm. all of this. So yeah. the two together, you can really get yeah. a good idea of, of what this case is all about. So yeah. I would def- definitely recommend watching that if you are interested in this case afterwards, because it was pretty interesting to watch it all play out and mm-hmm. get a better feel for it all. And kind of, you know, put an image in your head. So I liked it. It was pretty good. So this case starts off with Deborah Newell and John Mian, and mm-hmm. they have this first date together in October 2014 in Irvine, California. They meet up at this Houston's Steakhouse restaurant. And to just describe what both of these individuals look like and kind of a little bit about them, Deborah is a very beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. She's in her 50s. She's 59 at the time. She's been married and divorced four times. So she's had Mm -hmm. a a lot of heartbreak in her life for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But she's really successful. She owns a successful interior design company called Ambrosia. And so when she showed up for this date, she was looking good. I mean, she had all mm-hmm. of the designer clothes and purses and all that. She was very well put together, I guess, is the, the right yeah. word. And just successful, independent, um, beautiful, something that a lot of men would be looking for. Exactly. Um, yeah. Blonde, just gorgeous. Yes, exactly. And then there's John Meehan, and he is a very interesting individual to he's, say the least <laughs> yes he's 55 years old at the time and i actually could not find deborah's birthday because i like to look at you know sun signs and astrology a little bit it might help you understand that individual a little bit mm-hmm. more and couldn't find her sun sign for some reason or her birthday interesting maybe she doesn't want her age out there yeah is her age out there well is yeah her, age, her age is out there but i don't think i couldn't find her birthday it's got to be somewhere yeah it's probably just hard to find but John is an Aquarius, which is interesting when you find out all of the things that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, it might help make sense of things a little bit. But he's an attractive individual. He's like a very manly looking guy. He's a bigger dude. He's like six foot two. He's muscular. He's definitely in great shape for his age, for being mm-hmm. 55 years old. He's definitely in really good shape, mm-hmm. works out, and... The only difference is, is that he does not come to this date dressed to impress like Deborah did. He comes in very casual wear, almost kind of looking a bit homeless a little bit, if that's even the right word, or homely looking. Well, they actually did describe him as homeless. Mm-hmm. His, her daughter thought he looked homeless. Yeah. So that's probably the right word. And he showed up in shorts, mm. which is interesting for if you're going to a steakhouse for a first yeah. date, you would think that you would dress like... And a little bit nicer attire, but he showed up in pretty chill clothing. Mm-hmm. And didn't pa- make the greatest impression on her. No, no, definitely did not wow her when mm-hmm. she first saw him. But they actually found each other on an over 50 dating site. And when Deborah found his profile, the what he had on his profile was, quote unquote, safe, Christian, divorced, physician. Those were the, you know, like when you look at a dating profile, those were the mm-hmm. kind of keywords that he put for himself. Mm-hmm. Christian divorce physician. And so she was interested by these things and she had gone on some previous dates with some other guys and she just didn't really find them all that interesting. You know, they were successful or whatever, but she was really looking for that person that she could really connect with and yeah. would be interested in her you know, talking about her and what Mm -hmm. she's doing and her business and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think she'd been through like, you know, so many breakups and I guess divorces that she was really ready to meet like someone who she could really deeply connect with and have a relationship that was deeper. Right, right. Exactly. And John was that person. He was different in the sense that he showed genuine interest in her life. Yeah. And in her and made her feel really special and really praised her and just, you know, was wowed that she was so successful as a woman and started her own business and raised kids by herself a lot of the years. And, you know, she was, she's very independent and impressive. Mm -hmm. And Deborah was really attracted to John because not only was he interested in her, but he also had really interesting stories to tell. Yeah. Because like he would, 
when she was like, well, what do you do? Like, kind of like, what's your background? He would tell her that he was an anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. so a doctor, and he went to Iraq for a while. He was there that past year when they met with Doctors Without Borders. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because obviously if you meet somebody like that, you're going to be like, oh, wow, I want to yeah. know more about that. Like, that's so yeah. different from your typical guy. I'm sure right. she would date so just like i said deborah you know had a lot of the qualities that men were looking for i think he had a lot of the qualities that she was also looking for so right. it's kind of like the perfect situation yeah it really was and he said that he had a couple kids and that he owned homes in newport beach and palm springs so from first glance i mean she's like oh he's a successful he's, doctor he's yeah. doing well <laughs> he's but got he's money. also involved in charity he's got children mm -hmm. He's got a good job. He's not like needy. She was like, hmm, this is interesting. Yeah. She was definitely intrigued by him mm -hmm. right off the bat. He definitely wooed her. And I think that surge of attention that he gave her kind of like put up a little bit of a filter, you know, yeah. when she was looking at him because yeah. then he started saying some things that would be very weird to most of us on a first date. Mm hmm. Like he said that he'd love to meet her grandkids just like right after meeting her. And then yeah. he said that she stopped his heart and that she was so beautiful and so much her type, which if you think about on a first date, like that's a little forward, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. And you wonder like, mm, how many other women have you used that line on? Are you just yeah. trying to impress me? I mean, I would be a little cautious about that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he started getting like touchy feely with her. He'd start like, rubbing yeah. his her back up and down like yeah at the restaurant and be like, it's like first date you're so beautiful that's just stressful mm -hmm. and yeah but if we're used to men that do the opposite of that mm -hmm. that might be like a welcomed surprise in some sense and i think for her it kind of was a fresh comforting yeah it just was something different and new and kind of like oh like wow yeah it was only a little exciting he's working hard here like to try mm -hmm. to impress me mm -hmm. And so he ends up going back with Deborah after dinner to her penthouse that she was staying in. And the way he acts is just so bizarre. He goes like into the penthouse with her mm -hmm. and then goes like right to her bed and just mm -hmm. like sprawls out on the bed. He clearly thought that because they were going home together that that was an invitation right. to, you know, get in her bed, which is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You don't go to like if she made the move, that's different. But. He just like jumped into her bed jumped. and got comfortable. Yeah. And he started saying things to her like, this feels so incredible. And she's like, dude, this is just a mattress, man. That's literally what she said. It's just a mattress. And so obviously this is kind of starting to creep her out a little bit, I think. Yeah. And so she's like, hey, man, like, why don't, you know, why don't we end the night here? Yeah. Time to go. And he's like resistant. Like he mm -hmm. definitely fights it a bit. And, and he had been drinking that night too. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Which could have played into it for sure. Oh, I think it definitely did. I don't think he would have done that at the start of the date. I think as you get comfortable with yeah. somebody drinking together, that totally. you know, boundaries get blurred. Yeah. And for him, he doesn't have much boundaries. Well, so. and he clearly <laughs> thought, you know, he was gonna get some and he yeah. didn't. And right. so yeah. that kind of made him a little bitchy there at the mm -hmm. end, I think. So he left and yeah, she was like, This dude is a jerk man like what the hell mm -hmm. like how did our night go from so yeah. good to being so weird yeah, at the i end? really liked him at first and what happened yeah so the next day she's back at work and she's felt like disappointed with how the night went and how it ended and work was something very important to her it was something she spent 30 years building this yeah. business very very Baby. successful no way Yes, definitely her baby and her escape kind of it's you know some people everybody has their escape or mm -hmm. or whatever and hers was and some, for some people it's work and mm -hmm. she just absolutely loved it super passionate about it and which made her very successful and wealthy mm -hmm. um, her business did really well yeah she actually designed like model homes and clubhouses things like that like interiors for rooms you know you could go into her showroom and she'd be like here's a bath you know bedroom yeah. or whatever concepts for rooms exactly i've never done that personally but it looks kind of cool to go in there and just like have somebody plan out a room for you but oh have, we've never had a designer you mean yeah 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 
To have well, because like I like to do it. It's fun. I wouldn't want true. someone else to do that. That's like the <laughs> best part of owning a house is That's decorating true. it. That's true. No, I actually do enjoy decorating our house. Yeah. I always find furniture. I'm like, oh, I look good in here. Yeah, I like. it's like makes it your own. I don't like to follow trends or like trying to make it look like a certain style. I like to just make it my style. Yeah, yeah. and I think for like her clients, she probably worked with really, really wealthy people that have like 80 yeah. million rooms oh, and they yeah. can't possibly yeah. do it all themselves. Right. So or it's I, just people that like aren't as into that or right. don't enjoy or just don't have the natural taste for that or don't care. Just right. Or want it to look good. Stuff. Businesses. Definitely. Or it doesn't really, you know, they're, yeah. here's well, the look we're going for. To it. No, I've always been curious though, if we did hire an interior designer, like what would they be like? You need to change this in your house or this or that. Mm -hmm. So that's what she did and she really enjoyed it. And later that day, she ended up getting a call from john and he called and said hey i'm really sorry for the way the previous night went he mm -hmm. knew he fucked up with her and so he just tried to smooth it over with her and say like i want to spend every minute with you oh i'd be so creeped out though mm -hmm. every minute with you really dude right away so and apparently she texted him so you are the real thing and then he replied with best thing that will ever happen to you the day after their first date that's what he told her which is so Hmm. it's not funny but it's kind of ironic considering everything that unfolds yeah no for sure because this was not the best thing that ever happened to her no. by any means so after john smooth things over they proceeded to go on some more dates and by the second or third date john was telling deborah that he loved her and that he wanted to marry her dude no that's just insane i'd be so creeped out by that who says that their second or third date man you don't know someone enough to like want to commit to marry them by then what but could somebody like blow you away enough that you would just not really think about that like do you believe in love at first sight right exactly yeah. maybe maybe she was feeling that really deep connection with him and like maybe this person could be the one i want to be with and that's why she was okay with it because she wasn't freaked out by the things that he was saying at first. She actually enjoyed it. She thought it was, found it welcoming. Which wow. Is, yeah. I would just be like, God, what are your real intentions? Especially like, I feel like you have to be somewhat cautious when you have money like that. Like, you know, she does and she had nice cars and nice things. And like, wouldn't you want to be a little cautious of anyone that wants to marry you on the second or third date? Right. Especially when you've been married and through the divorce process several times, mm -hmm. you'd think you'd be a little more like, yeah, I don't know. Worried or cautious. Like he had a spell over her or something mm -hmm. like, yeah, he had some power over her. He unseen had force. a very charismatic way about him. He had an ability to just wow people like charm them is really mm -hmm. the word yeah. like he could really charm her for sure yes put on a front play an act he's one of those people that had a story for everything he you could never catch john in an awkward position where he didn't know how to respond to something he was mm -hmm. quick he's very smart quick. he could very witty and he could always find an answer to your question for him and it's normally the people that think quick on their feet like that that end up lying so much because yeah. they're good at it. When right. you're good at lying, you lie a lot sometimes, you know. And people you're, aren't able to detect that you're lying because you're so good true. at it. True, right. The better you get at it, so the harder it is. So you seem like this honest, genuine person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the very strange things about John was that he wore his scrubs everywhere, which how many doctors wear their scrubs everywhere? I feel like it was to make it more obvious that he was a doctor. Yeah. Like impress her. Yeah. Yeah. Like a status symbol or something to wear mm -hmm. scrubs. Mm -hmm. One time she even invited him to this formal charity event. Like everyone was dressed up really nice. These charity events are nice, yeah. especially in California and stuff. Yeah. And he ended up coming in scrubs <laughs> and he said he was too busy to change out of his scrubs. Which it's like, come on. There's a picture of them at this charity event. And yeah. He's literally in two different colored scrubs oh looking gosh, like a looks scrub ridiculous can yeah. you even do that i guess that just looks ridiculous though yeah it's just like i don't know many like an anesthesiologist really is not gonna change out of his scrubs before what does he do he does you know he does all this work all day in his scrubs there's like 
could be bodily fluids all over him and well, stuff. He's wearing him to a charity event. Like, yeah, I think he wanted to put off to all of her friends as well. Yeah. The people that were there that I'm Portray. a busy doctor. Yes. I'm so busy that I can't even change totally, totally. to get here. Yeah. There is one detail about it is that his scrubs at the bottom were all frayed at the bottom from like wearing them all the time and outside and in the streets and stuff because he, he, just, like, wore, he, he wore, wore them that much that they were all like messed up at the bottom. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Which Do is, they get like that just in the hospital though? No. No. Oh. No. Cuz you have to go across rough ground to be to, like really fray them up that bad. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And at for long periods of time. So it is very very bizarre. So after just a few short dates John started spending the night at Deborah's penthouse and Deborah's daughter, Jacqueline actually lived there with Deborah mm -hmm. and she was irked obviously that this random dude is starting to stay the night at her mom's house. But John would yeah. of course act super creepy while he was there. Like he would look around at everything cause obviously a penthouse is going to be decorated very well mm -hmm. and there's tons of expensive furniture and artwork and jewelry around been in a penthouse no i definitely haven't no i definitely haven't either it sounds really nice yeah isn't that like what just classifies you as a penthouse i think a penthouse is usually the, the top, top floor yeah. of an, a fancy apartment building okay yeah so. it just means rich basically yeah <laughs> if you're in a penthouse you probably got money yeah but jacqueline like you know she had a sense about him right away and like she's like we said she you know said he looked like a loser yeah and looked homeless when right. she first saw him mm -hmm. but she didn't have a good impression of him and you know they're very high class people so they were like they had a good hell? read on him or she had a good read on him she right probably away. think that i look homeless too though <laughs> yeah. to be fair yeah she's so, very fancy obviously they're all into the designer bags and everything and very into fashion yeah I mean, this is Orange County, California, too. That's right. kind of how everybody is out there. Yeah, you and have they're to in like the designer community. Right. Yeah. Totally. Makes sense. The whole life. But she actually had a safe for her <laughs> bags because some of those bags go for thousands and thousands of dollars. It's kind of ridiculous. Isn't honestly. that insane? Birkin and Cartier or whatever. Oh, uh, I get like, I have trouble even spending like money <laughs> on a purse at Target. Yeah. So she had these bags in a safe and John was very interested in knowing what was in the safe and what of they were he and was. value and everything, which yeah. I think Jacqueline started like, this is kind of a red flag. Like, why is this mm -hmm. dude so into like everything that's in her house and mm -hmm. asking questions about this thing? Well, like we said, Deborah was, you know, kind of blinded by love. Like you could say, mm -hmm. um, she had rose colored glasses on when it came t to John and who he was. And, you know, as a, person who's not falling in love with him you could probably see things that she didn't or maybe you notice red flags more you're more like she was more willing to let things go that she that came up about john like weird stuff like that she just kind of be like okay whatever but yeah. jacqueline really pushed her definitely yeah and it's it's gonna throw me off because her name in the show was not jack veronica was veronica show, or victoria yeah. or something yeah i thought it was yeah i think it was yeah. veronica why'd they change her name for that it's so weird it's tv man it's Hollywood. Yeah. But um, Jacqueline was definitely, you know, concerned about right. him right away. Like didn't, she was seeing all of the red flags. Yeah. And didn't really want him around. So the fact that he started staying the night there was kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. And Deborah right. obviously starts creating tension between her and Deborah. So her and John decide that we need to find our own place to live. And pretty soon they found a $6,500 a month house on the boardwalk on balboa island in newport beach which is a really nice area and so she let her daughter keep the penthouse and her and john moved into this new place and in order to do that's this so crazy. yeah it is and i mean 6500 a month that's that's a lot for rent that's for a sure. lot oh my gosh and she had to put down eighty thousand dollars in order to lease the place for a year and when she asked John, like, hey, you're this anesthesiologist, like, why aren't you getting in on the lease yeah. with her? And she was like, and he was like, well, I've got tax problems, so I can't be on the lease. Ah. Which, hmm, red flag. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. So she was like, okay, well, you know, I'll just put the money down and it'll be in my name. The lease will be. So at this point in time, they've only been together for five weeks. 
and they've gotten their own place. And Deborah agreed to not tell anybody about it because she knew that they would be pissed if John was moving in with her so mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. And so when she told Jacqueline she could have the penthouse, she was like, I'm going to go get my own place so that, you know, you don't have to deal with John or whatever. But yeah. she never told her that he was actually going to like make that his residence. Yeah, completely move in with her mm -hmm. after five weeks. I mean, that's such a blimp in time right? Mm -hmm. in a relationship. Oh, it's so fast. Oh my gosh. It's I feel like how can you get to know months. someone really in that time? Mm -hmm. And to, to already. To in? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's just taking things so fast. But that's the kind of person he was. You know, he was already like jumping in her bed on night one. M asking him. He Asking her to marry him like a couple yeah. days in. That's, wooing her. Yeah. And just, yeah. Yeah. And the wooing was definitely something that she really liked because mm -hmm. he went above and beyond to really make her feel special. Mm -hmm. And he would like bring her coffee in the morning, go mm -hmm. get her groceries. He'd take her cars in to get maintenance and he even carried her purse for her. Made her feel really a like a queen. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Know, really well taken care of. Exactly. She thought, you know, once her kids got to know John a little bit more that eventually they would come around to the whole situation. Yeah. So she was just like going to temporarily keep it from them. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's never good to keep secrets like that in your family. Right. It and created a lot of problems for them. It did. And obviously Jacqueline was already starting to raise some suspicions about mm -hmm. John. So she, her other daughter, Tara, if anybody was going to give John a chance, it was going to be her. Mm -hmm. And Tara is her youngest daughter at the time. She was 23 years old. And she's kind of the opposite type of person from mm -hmm. Jacqueline. She's very non-confrontational. She's like the sweet sister. And more reserved. Jacqueline is more tough and assertive type individual. Right. And at the time, Tara was living in Las Vegas with her boyfriend, Jimmy, studying to become a dog groomer. And when she heard about John, she was very skeptical about him because why would such a great guy, quote unquote, still be single? Yeah, it I does make wonder you wonder, too. right? Like, mm -hmm. why are, you know... What's such a catch? Or like you would think like, wouldn't you have just come from a long term marriage, like a really long relationship or something? Mm -hmm. Like if you're such a great guy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It does it definitely makes you mm -hmm. at least wonder a little bit about his past right. and like why is he not still married? You mm -hmm. know, he had kids He's and such stuff. a catch. Mm -hmm. yeah. He treats you so well. Why yeah. why my mom? Probably. Right. Yeah. And so the skepticism only grew when Tara and her boyfriend drove out to Southern California to meet him. And at this point in time, they were actually still moving into the new house when Tara and her boyfriend got there. And when he met, and when Tara met John for the first time, she immediately noticed how cold he was towards her. Which like, is so weird. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of the opposite of what you would think somebody so great yeah. would act like, especially yeah. towards a, their you know, kid. Yeah, and you'd think that since he had such a bad um, impression with Jacqueline and he knew Jacqueline already didn't like him, right, that, that he would try, try and nope. see, like, you know, the more family members I can get on my side, the better. Mm -hmm. But no, he just decides to be mean to her right away. Yeah, like wouldn't answer any of her questions, just kind of cold towards her. He tried to act really tough and macho in front of her. He actually, like, picked up Deborah's mattress and, like, muscled in, into the house all by himself and just was like acting really strange and she said that her dogs were even seemed anxious around john which is interesting because i feel like dogs do sense those types of things like they can oh, sense totally how you feel or the energy you're putting off so i think they can sense energy for sure i feel like my dogs can even sense when i have like high anxiety like mm -hmm. when i'm feeling anxious they like don't want to be super close to me yeah and when I'm more calm, they like will cuddle with me. But I think they like pick up on energies. Totally. You know? So all of that's happening. And she's starting to wonder to herself, like, why does this doctor have no car? That's yeah. what I would wonder, too. He, yeah, like, what the fuck? Where's his fucking car at? It's only his mo her mom's cars that are there. Mm -hmm. And then why has no one seen John's houses in Newport Beach and Palm Springs that mm -hmm. he claimed he had? Yeah, wouldn't you want to show those off if you had multiple That's houses? Thought, like, like, bring your lady to them. She didn't even think to go to his place of residence before moving in with him or like making <laughs> sure know. he even had a home. Like, I know. I mean, I really feel for Deborah mm -hmm. and I'm not putting blame on her. This is him yeah. for sure. But, you know, you do wonder like, hmm, were there things that she just purposely ignored? Like, how much of it? 
like is it possible she knew kind of and was aware that like this is a little sketchy and like yeah had yeah. some skeptical Probably. thoughts towards him but just was like i'm not even gonna think that because like this is so great right. and he's so awesome and like i think she know. just kind of pushed it to the side at least for now and was just mm-hmm. like i'm gonna enjoy this because mm-hmm. my happiness is off right. the charts right now so i'm yeah. gonna just ride She's the like wave running a bit. on endorphins and Total, just- totally totally being in love f- feels awesome, you know, when you, especially in that first, oh, you know, yeah. couple weeks or like when we first moved in together, it was really exciting. Or when we first started dating, mm-hmm. you know, you're kind of in this like fantasy world together yeah. a little bit. They call it like the honeymoon stage. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just so happy and so high on love and just running on that. Right. That I think yeah. you would be willing think, to be like, I don't want anything to mess this up. Yeah. I think some things start to just kind of disappear out of your vision a little bit because you're so laser focused on what's in front of you right that you start forgetting the things that are happening behind the scenes or what you don't know about Mm -hmm. somebody Mm -hmm. you know you're Mm -hmm. just focused on what you do know and that's that they love and care about you so much that you just want to eat that up you know yeah and And just enjoy that butterfly feeling that you have in the beginning it's so exciting and new and yeah she didn't want anything to mess it up yeah and something interesting that Tara thought was a bit weird was that John would spend all day playing Call of Duty on her mom's 70 inch TV she bought. (laughs) That's so pathetic. Yeah, he's a doctor and he still has time. Wouldn't he be like tired, like from all the work? Yeah. Isn't it like mad hours as an anesthesiologist and like odd times surgeries are long? To spend all day, like all day playing. Yeah, like he has no surgeries. Yeah. Yeah, very odd. I mean, Mm -hmm. pretty, it shows like some immaturity too. Mm -hmm. You know, like play it whatever here and there, but like to spend a whole day, multiple days. Yeah. He definitely acted like he was younger than he actually was. Like really, you don't have more important priorities than playing video games all day on your girlfriend's big screen TV in her house that you don't pay for. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Another red flag maybe? Totally. But Tara and her boyfriend actually ended up moving into a spare bedroom in her mom's place for a few days. And obviously this made it hard for Deborah to maintain this illusion that John mm-hmm. really didn't live there because she <laughs> yeah. like noticed he had all of his shit there. Like yeah, all of his ointments and accessories and not only just that, but clothes and belongings and boxes of things. Like I think you'd start figuring out like, Hey, he's not just like staying here a couple nights a week or something like he's living here for sure. So obviously it didn't take long for her to discover the truth. And the way that they found out was the day before Thanksgiving, she found a nursing certificate with John's name on it, which clearly, you know, a nurse is not an anesthesiologist. So why Uh is he calling himself a doctor? Uh Oh, But he had an explanation for this. He said he called himself a doctor because he had a PhD plus advanced training in anesthesiology. Yeah. Okay, dude. Sure, bro. And he was pissed when he realized that Tara had been snooping through his stuff. And this is where they kind of saw his mean side Mm -hmm. because he was lit about this. Like he was not freaking out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He started yelling at her saying like why are you going through my stuff Mm -hmm. why are you trying to steal deborah from me oh my god right away yeah yeah like you just like met her other daughter for the first time you start saying shit like this and then he said do you realize kids should be smacked for this oh my god (laughs) and that just gives you a little bit of an insight of what his childhood looked like you know yeah totally because only somebody that went through that as a child would probably say something like that yeah especially to a 20 something year old woman like it's a kind of weird thing to say to her yeah and so obviously she didn't like this and she screamed at her mom how could you let this guy talk to me like this and i'd be the same way i'd be pissed Mm -hmm. if some guy came into my life and was just talking to me like that i'd be like how dare you are you know speak to me like that unless she did something that really deserved it then what the hell i'd be like so shocked that a stranger was yelling at me like that that i barely knew yeah oh yeah it'd be be a major issue yeah would not be happy about that and john started telling deborah that the reason her kids were being so hostile towards him was because they didn't want her to be happy and that they just wanted her to be dead so they could collect 
That's so ridiculous. That's so insane. But didn't she think in her own head, like, that's not true and know that about her kids, that that wasn't true? Well, that's must have what, that must have been what she did. Like, just brush it off. Like, oh, John, you're just being yeah, over dramatic. Right? Like, yeah, don't say that crazy shit. Like, what the <laughs> hell? Of course, John was all about this advice, especially the fact that the therapist actually told Deborah that if John was the man she wanted to be with, then that was her right. So the therapist really helped his situation more so than her situation with her kids for sure well and the therapist doesn't know what the daughters know about john and like the red flags obviously they're going to give the therapist a very filtered version of everything mm -hmm. so i mean maybe in some cases you would say you need boundaries and stuff yeah yeah but they didn't know what was truly no. going on clearly didn't know anything about john or what he had already been doing and saying most likely but John and Deborah were living the dream life in their rental home on Balboa Island. Their house was literally on the boardwalk and they had a beautiful view. It's really a beautiful place for sure. And John was just such a fun guy to be with. He was super playful with her and more often than not just acting straight up like a kid. He would take shirtless selfies of his abs for Deborah. Hell yeah. And would constantly say how damn good looking he was. <laughs> <laughs> dude he is a sociopath <laughs> he was full of himself for sure <laughs> but one of the things that bothered deborah about john was the fact that he had a shit wardrobe he literally only wore baggy pants and shorts with like college shirts everywhere along with his scrubs and when she was like dude like what's up with your wardrobe he was like all my good clothes got stolen while i was in iraq <laughs> convenient that that works all of the nice clothes yeah what? why did you have them all your nice clothes with you in iraq well, you brought your suits and your blazers <laughs> to like iraq. Need my nicest gear yeah what the hell how does that even make sense so he ended up telling her to dress him he said mm. i want to please you so they had a little shopping spree at the brooks brothers and she bought him an entirely new wardrobe that she thought a doctor should already have you know yeah Hooked him, him up. up. Hooked him mm -hmm. up with super expensive, nice clothes. Mm -hmm. And John was like, all right, this works for me. And so he was like, well, you know what else I want? I want to marry you. <laughs> so he kept begging Deborah literally on a regular basis to get married. But she would resist him all the way up until early December when he actually went with her on a business trip to Las Vegas. And at this point in time, she finally gave in because, I mean, you're in Vegas mm -hmm. and like, you know, you can get married in Vegas on a whim, so why not? I mean, there's a good chance that they were like drinking too. And like, yeah, you know, it was yeah. a spur of the moment thing. Yeah. I mean, maybe he knew that too. He's like, let's get her to Vegas. He probably was like, this is a perfect opportunity. Yeah. I got to make sure I go with her to I'll Vegas. Just be so cause... romantic. She won't be able to say no. Right. He just would charm her so yes. much. Oh, yeah. He really did. So they literally got married after less than two months of dating. No one was invited to the wedding <laughs> and there's no. a picture of them standing in like just this plain ass room. Like it looks like one of those little wedding chapels maybe, or I don't know, maybe this is like the courthouse. I'm not sure exactly where and they, they got look married. They pretty but... well put together. They don't look like drunk. It's no. like a hangover situation here. <laughs> yeah. But. No, not quite. <laughs> they look happy. She looks happy. Yeah. They clearly exchange rings and everything. And yeah, they got married and Deborah decided to keep the wedding a secret because uh, the Christmas was approaching and she'd have to be around her family again. And that was very worrisome yeah. to have to reveal that she got married now to John uh, with her whole family that did not like John because they were planning to have a traditional family Christmas get together at the home of her oldest daughter, Nicole. And Jacqueline refused to go because she's just like, I'm not going to take part in this mm -hmm. and Tara was pretty torn because she didn't want to go either since John was going to be there. Mm -hmm. And as a result of all this, Tara ended up going to a therapist with Deborah and decided that she would go to the get together, but she, they had to keep her away from John and John kind of interact with the kids. Like John kind of had to be separate from everybody else. And that was one thing she was worried about was the kids being near the yes. kids. Yes. You know that they would have another person lost she said yes in their life because right. she'd had other partners and boyfriends and, yeah yeah so i'm sure know. it was hard on the grandkids and and yeah you know, 
to I mean, some extent. I think extent. she used it as kind of an excuse just to be like, I don't want John there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, but, that was kind of their deal. Mm-hmm. But the exact opposite happened. John came and of course he like brought a bunch of presents for all the kids and everything. Yeah, and as soon as he walked happy. in, they all just like swarmed him. Mm-hmm. And that really upset Tara because she was just like, this is exactly what I told you Not I didn't want to happen, mom. Like, what the hell? Yeah. And he was, yeah, he was even supposed to be there. So she started freaking out and like crying and was like, I just want to leave. I don't like him. And so, yeah, after Christmas, Tara and her boyfriend returned to Vegas. Uh, they were like, we're getting away from this situation. So obviously because of this Christmas debacle, she decided not to talk to her mom anymore. She's like, we're going to have a little break. Yeah. Stop talking to each other. And meanwhile, back in Orange County, Jacqueline is starting to do some amateur detective work on John. And she noticed something that's kind of weird. John's fingernails were always dirty. And Jacqueline was very beautiful and accomplished. And she definitely had been around doctors before. And she knew that, you know, she actually did some work for a plastic surgeon. And the doctor's nails are always trimmed, always clean. Because, like, what the hell? Like, you work with your hands on people you know you wear gloves and stuff but you can't have like nasty fingernails long sharp to cut through the gloves and stuff well i mean as an anesthesiologist i don't know if you'd have to like trim them as much but you definitely need to keep them clean and you have to clean your hands for a decent amount of time i think there's like a a time limit or something you're you're supposed to follow like a yeah guided amount of time to wash your hands like you're supposed to wash your hands so many times per day as a doctor like every time you do certain things yeah like clearly you'd have clean hands if you work in a fucking hospital. Right. Like, yeah. If you're scrubbing in, all I would the be time. like weirded out by that too. Like, unless it's like, dude, were you like planting some stuff after work or like, yeah. Why are your hands so dirty? Yeah. yeah. Well, and then the whole scrubs thing, like he's always in his damn scrubs, mm-hmm. but it with dirty hands. Yeah. Like just where? got off the clock, but my hands are covered in mud. Like mm-hmm. what? Yeah. doesn't make any sense. And she also started receiving misspelled texts from her mom, which were clearly not from her. Mm. as well as her mom complaining to her about money missing from her wallet. So all of these things, Jacqueline's putting it all together, being like, something is just off here. Yeah, Something is weird with John, so let's try to find out more. So she decides to buy a magnetic tracker and puts it on her mom's Tesla so that she can monitor where John went when he left the house. So this guy, is no, he's a doctor, he has no car. He's driving his wife's Tesla everywhere, and so she starts watching to see where he goes and he just went to doctor's offices in Irvine and Mission Viejo and San Diego, a warehouse, a post office, fast food joints and Tesla charging portals. Mm. Based upon those places, nothing is like glaringly, mm-hmm. you know, obvious or out of the ordinary, seem like pretty typical places. So he he said he was like, you know, he worked with different clinics and things like that that mm-hmm. sort of needed him and he got paid in cash a lot. So he, you know, he said he worked with uninsured patients and that's how they would pay. So it kind of made sense that he was bouncing around to different places. But when she actually told Tara that she put the tracker on the car and was tra- starting to look into John Moore, Tara was concerned for her mom that maybe if John found out what they were doing, that he might hurt her. Mm-hmm. And this especially hit home with them because they knew about her mom's past and her mom's past is, is really crazy. Actually. Um, it goes back to March 8th, 1984. So Deborah had a sister named Cindy who was shot and killed by her husband, Billy Vickers. So the couple was in the process of separating Mm -hmm. and the murder took place in the kitchen of the home. They had just sold in Laguna, California. Billy shot Cindy in the back of the head at close range, then shot himself in the stomach and called the emergency services. And at the trial, Cindy's mom, Arlene Hart, testified in Billy's defense, explaining that she loved him and did not believe he had been in his right mind when he shot and killed her daughter. Like defending Billy, which is so weird. Yeah, that is weird. And they tried to kind of show that weird relationship between them in the show, too. Like they. Mm -hmm. Billy really confided in Arlene and or Arlene. Yeah. Sorry. No, you're good. 
You're good. Just Billy really confided in Arlene and trusted her. I mean, at least that's what they showed in the, in the mm-hmm. TV show. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of weird. Like they say that she was really religious. And so she really believed in forgiveness right. and like, you know, being able to repent your sins and, you know. Yeah. But the prosecutor of this whole trial actually said that the way he interpreted her testimony was that they were painting Cindy in a negative light. They quote unquote, they threw her under the bus. That's so weird. Which is very weird. Like you'd her think own you'd daughter. Take your daughter's like, side. Yeah. 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 There's one thing to forgive, but then defend them and like blame your daughter is a whole different thing. So obviously this experience has a part and a role in Deborah's life and impacted yeah. her quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But the jury actually acquitted Billy of murder, but they actually ended up charging him with voluntary manslaughter, which he ultimately pleaded guilty to in exchange for a five-year sentence. Wow. <sighs> oh my God. And he was released in 1986 after serving less than three years in prison for shooting Cindy. Yeah. That's it's crazy. Crazy. And then they still had a relationship with each other yeah, after that. Yeah. Like not a relationship. I don't mean to say it like that, but yeah. you know what I mean? They, she still would like talk to him and was right. friendly with him and would see him every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy. It's very bizarre. But this whole incident was the reason why Deborah hated firearms because as we'll talk about later it's kind of crazy that she didn't own a gun Mm -hmm. Um, but she hated them and refused to have them around despite you know maybe needing one Mm -hmm. but yeah this this event in her life definitely i think played a part in how she responded to this whole john situation yeah so before we get into this next event which is very bizarre we'd like to thank our last sponsors for today other than your absolute best friends who could you ask to bring you red wine at 4 p.m sushi at 9 p.m. and a breakfast burrito at 8 a.m. Postmates, you do you. They don't judge. They just deliver. They come in clutch many times for us with a new laptop charger when we need it from Best Buy or when we run out of pet food, they can bring us some more. It's really, really convenient because Postmates is your personal food delivery, grocery delivery, whatever you can think of delivery service all year round. No more trips to the store. You don't even have to know where the store is. Postmates will deliver anything to you. All you got to do is download the app for iOS or Android for free, browse local restaurants and businesses, and track your delivery. They're open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they'll bring you whatever you want within an hour. Anything you're craving, seriously, anything Postmates can deliver. They're the largest on-demand network in the known universe with more than 25 thousand partner merchants and for a limited time postmates is giving our listeners one hundred dollars of free delivery credit for your first seven days to start your free deliveries download the app right now and use code mile higher that's code mile higher for one hundred dollars of free delivery credit for your first seven days when you download the postmates app get anything you need anytime you need it download postmates and save with code mile higher Big news, everyone. Yes, it is finally happening. This is the year 2020 that I'm going to have straight whitened teeth by the end of the year. And I'm doing that with candid clear aligners. And you could be too. And if you're anything like me and you're unhappy with your smile or self-conscious in photos, or maybe you never got to have braces as a kid like me, I recommend you check out Candid. They deliver clear aligners directly to you and straighten your teeth for 65% less than the cost of braces. And unlike braces, Candid's aligners are comfortable, they're removable, and they're totally invisible. So you can transform your smile a little bit at a time without anybody knowing. And you're never gonna have to set foot in a doctor's office or a waiting room to do it. It's super, super convenient. Your treatment is prescribed remotely by a licensed orthodontist, and then Candid delivers everything that you need right to your door all at once. You're not getting a monthly thing. You get one package of all your liners up front. And unlike other companies, Candid only works with orthodontists and never general dentists. That means that your treatment will be designed by an expert in tooth movement with 20 years of experience on average. The average treatment time is around six months, but it varies depending on how much you know straightening needs to be done. And you'll also be whitening at the same time, which is really cool. You can learn more about Candid's process and get a complimentary 3D scan of your teeth. It's the simplest and freest way to get started. So are you ready to take the first step towards straighter teeth? For a limited time, you can get started with $75 off by using the code MILEHIGHER at candidco.com slash milehigher. Again, that's candidco.com slash milehigher 
and use the code MILEHIGHER for $75 off. CandidCo.com slash MILEHIGHER, code MILEHIGHER. Let's face it, New Year's resolutions don't always stick, especially the ones that focus on health, because those require the most work. Every year, I tell myself that I'm going to eat better, eat healthier foods, and make sure I eat a breakfast every morning, because obviously, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but every year, I seem to fail at doing exactly those things. But Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat well. They deliver thoughtfully sourced, chef-crafted food right to my door, and everything can be prepared in five minutes or less. Daily Harvest is something that you can enjoy year-round as a quick solution to get the fruits and vegetables you need every day. Daily Harvest works directly with farmers to harvest organic fruits and vegetables at their peak and freezes them within 24 hours to lock in their nutrients. Everything stays fresh until you're ready to enjoy it. You can choose from over 65 different options like smoothies, hearty soups, harvest bowls, and overnight oats. Each recipe takes one step to prepare with room to make them your own. Add your favorite milk to blend up a smoothie or heat up a harvest bowl and top it with an avocado or fried egg. I've been really enjoying these daily harvest smoothies. It's been great to get up in the morning and know that I can have a delicious, nutritious smoothie for breakfast in literally under five minutes. You just pop the top off, open it, put some milk in it, throw in a blender, blend it for a few minutes, and there you go. You've got breakfast ready to go. So whether you're at home or at your desk or on the go, Daily Harvest is the easiest way to have a delicious, nutritious meal or snack. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code MILEHIGHER to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code MILEHIGHER for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. So this was kind of freaky after church one Sunday, which they were, there was religious and brought John to church with her. And she did say that he seemed to enjoy church. And when they came home, they walked into their living room and they found this strange woman there that they did not recognize. She was a very thin weathered looking woman in her late thirties. And she had curly blonde wet hair because she had just used their shower. And she was dressed in all white, wearing Deborah's clothes, holding a tiny Bible. The hell? That's so weird and random. What and the hell? she like walked up to them all creepy. Yeah. Like just freaky, you know, hanging out in their house, like yeah. scary movie style. Yeah. And so John's reaction to this is he like gets crazy and slams this woman's head into the countertop, <laughs> grabs her arms and like puts them behind her back. He's like, Deborah, get out of here and call the police. And Deborah's like, whoa, like, dude chill out like it's probably just like a homeless person that you know climbed into the house like you know we're fine we don't need to press charges or anything like that but the way that he reacted it was it was very odd and john denied knowing her but did he really not know her hmm Hmm. because first of all how did she know how to get in yeah right how do you just get into this really nice house in this neighborhood Right. So random. Like mm-hmm. this kind of thing doesn't happen in this area. Mm-hmm. So definitely. And she uh, wasn't stealing stuff. She no. was just like in the house. Just like in there chilling, using mm-hmm. the shower and stuff. It, it mm-hmm. really didn't make sense. But John used this event to ramp up security. Mm-hmm. Despite this being an already secure, nice neighborhood. And A lot of people think he knew her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he, if he did, then this was a complete setup. Clearly. I mean, I think he knew some sketchy people. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. But he decided to put up security cameras everywhere. So he put them all up inside the, the house as well as at Deborah's office. And he could control these cameras from his phone. Hmm. Is this really just for security? Mm. We'll see. Very controlling behavior. But one of the things that always just kind of made Deborah wonder was like, where did John go all day? Where did yeah. he work? Yeah. You just like take her Tesla and then go disappear. Around. I work at different hospitals around. Yeah. And she definitely thought it was weird that he was getting paid in cash. Like what kind of doctor gets paid yeah, in cash? Yeah, there's no way. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's crazy. Freelancing. But one day she pulled up the security footage on her phone and watched John leave the house in his scrubs and then return shortly after to climb back into bed and go to sleep (laughs) okay and of course when she questioned him he had a reason or explanation for Mm -hmm. he was like oh they canceled blah 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 yep like that's why i always go to bed so 
yeah, he always knew how to refute any sort of, you know, question that she had about what he was doing. But at age 59, Deborah thought that she had found the perfect guy and there was no way that she could be happier with anybody else because John would run errands the way her assistants, because John would run errands just like her assistants did for her. He'd pay the bills. He'd go to doctor's appointments with her. He'd buy her flowers all the time. He would hold her at night, breathing against her neck with his body draped over hers. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> John. <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, I know. Honestly, I'd be like, get the fuck away from me. If people are breathing on me at night, I cannot handle it. Oh, I know. Like we cuddle, but like not at falling asleep. Yeah, not like, breathing on each other either. Oh, like. definitely not. <laughs> like cuddling as you fall asleep though. Yeah. I don't know. I can't do that. Like too close to me and like, don't breathe on me and I don't want to breathe on you. And like, yeah. You know? and, and I think you're just so used to like as a human, like falling asleep by yourself that yeah. it can be hard to fall asleep like on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's <laughs> weird. Yeah. But John loved it. Draped over. Breathe her. on her, <laughs> like on her <laughs> neck and stuff. Like <laughs> I guess she liked it. Yeah. But John had scars all over his body, like on his abdomen and back, legs and ankles. And when she asked him about it, he had some great stories, man. He said that he'd been in a chopper crash as a medic mm -hmm. in the war zones of the Middle East right before he had met her. Really? And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he went on to say that during his time in the desert, he had learned something about himself. Five or six times he'd had to kill. It was easy if you had to. Five or six times as a fucking medic. I mean, I could understand like maybe once or twice, maybe like yeah, in a situation, what? but five or six times like that's a ballsy lie. Yeah. I always think it's interesting how people who are liars will make up some of the crazy slides. It's like they're so used to lying that they'll like take the risk even further and lie. Bigger lie, bigger lie, bigger lie. That is like insane to be like, I've killed five or six people like a lot of combat people don't. Go kill even one telling, or two. Or, yeah, or even talk you know, about it. Five or six, yeah. Alone, like, like, just brag be like, about it. Yeah, I, I could do it. It was easy. It was you know, easy. it's easy if you have to do it. Yeah. How obnoxious. He definitely liked to brag about this, like, ruthlessness that he, he embodied. But that's kind of a scary thing to tell someone, too. Like, I found killing to be quite easy, yeah, actually. Yeah, why would you, if you tell her to. that, too? Like, yeah. You wouldn't be like, you wouldn't like be worried she'd your freak out about that? It was easy oh, for I know. You to do that. Well, then he bragged about how he had blood relation to um, one of the notorious mafia hitmen who once run Murder Incorporated, which this is actually true. Like he had, he has family ties to the mafia. Wow. Um, nothing like super direct, I don't think, mm -hmm. but definitely some blood relation to it. And so he'd like brag about that. He thought it was like badass that he was associated with the mafia. And John would always tell Deborah that she made him a better man. So, so I think that's kind of like why he told her this stuff is because he used it to tell her, you know, I've been through all this crazy mm -hmm. shit, but I'm okay because yeah. I have you. So that yeah. builds this You're sort of. saving me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way he was saving her. So mm -hmm. they were just like helping each other and everything was so great. Mm -hmm. And then he would inject himself with testosterone for his kidneys, he'd say. And then he'd take Oxy for his bad back. Yikes. So Not those good. were. Mm -hmm. So Deborah's nephew, his name is Shad, and he's Cindy's son, her, her sister's son. The one who was murdered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's an adult at this point in time. Yeah. But he came over to meet John. And at first he kind of liked him because, I mean, I think everybody kind of liked John when they first met him. Mm -hmm. but Charismatic, then, charming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then I think as soon as you start to hear like he's a doctor and all this, you start asking some obvious questions. Yeah. Like, really, this doctor, you know, only had a few clothes when he first met her. And, you know, why does he play video games all day? And yeah. this doctor was really jumping out of helicopters with machine guns because mm -hmm. he, he would tell like these crazy stories about his time in Iraq all the time. Like all these. Yeah all these wild, wild things that happened to him over there. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's definitely starting to question it and it's just, you know, his story doesn't add up. So there's an incident that happened at Deborah's place in late February, 2015. And John was making margaritas in the kitchen when Jacqueline's name came up. And this is when he said something super fucking weird. He said, 
I could take her out from a thousand yards. I could what? take her yeah. out from a thousand yards, which implies like I could shoot her like a sniper or something. That's a decent distance away. Like that's very weird. And Shad said that Deborah just started laughing and didn't mm-hmm. take it seriously at all. Yeah. Can you imagine if someone said that about my kid? I'd be like, what did you just say? Yeah. Like, I don't understand what? that at all. Like, I get he's like a could take her out from a veteran or whatever. Words. And, you know, you might. Yeah. Because they definitely, you know, you might have some war zone humor, I guess is what you call it. But that's very uh, weird to say something that's about not funny. Your, <laughs> your wife's daughter. Like, really? Yeah. So like obviously after he heard this, his view of John changed and Mm -hmm. he started to worry for his aunt's safety and rightfully so. And once he found out that Jacqueline had hired a PI to look into John's past, uh, he actually wanted to take a look at the uh, first report that they did and it actually revealed a lot about the truth about John. Mm -hmm. And John had a bankruptcy, Mm -hmm. a nursing license, not a doctor's license, He had addresses in Arizona, Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee, and across California, including a recent one at a trailer park in the desert of Riverside County. So he followed up on this trailer park and he called the address there and a woman answered who said that she had had a relationship with John and then he disappeared. Mm. So he literally Mm. was out there living with this woman in, in this trailer park. Not that he long just, ago. Like, dipped out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but then when he followed up on the situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he upgraded a little bit. Yeah. But then he looked up this other address uh, out of California and it ended up being the Orange County Jail. Oh my gosh. And why you wouldn't like go right to Deborah and be like, yo, like, yeah. Look at what we found. Mm-hmm. The addresses literally say he was in jail. Mm-hmm. But at first they weren't positive that. The, it was the right, you know, the PI was like, well, it could be a different John, a different Mian. John Mian, but it's like, really? <laughs> well, John's kind of like a common name, but yeah. Mian's really not. Yeah. I'm like, it seems pretty clear that, I mean, how many John Mians are in California? Mm-hmm. Probably not that many. So in early March, 2015, Shad called Deborah and reminded her that he'd lost his mom and he didn't want to lose her too. And he said, quote unquote, what if he isn't who he says he is? What if he isn't an anesthesiologist? What if I could prove to you he was in jail and not Iraq? And her response was, even if it was true, I wouldn't care because I love him. Oh my gosh, that's so concerning. And that just shows you why everyone else. And like, it's so interesting that everyone around him and her were starting to pick up that John is weird. Like people that love her and don't care about him, you know? Mm. And she's just like so blinded by love that she's willing to look past all of this stuff. She's like, I just don't care. I'm happy. Like, and you know, I think she'd been through so many bad relationships and spent so long being unhappy that she was like, I want to be happy now, period. And I don't care like what he's been through. I just love him the way he is. Right. And because she loved him so much, she just told John exactly Mm -hmm. what Shad had told him. Yeah. And obviously John got pissed because he's like, Oh shit. What the hell? Like they're starting to dig into my past. Yep. And he started getting really nasty with Shad and would text him to like go away or he'd call the cops. And then, yeah, then he went on to say some really fucked up shit about his girlfriend and his daughters and then threaten him with violence if he continued to try to like meddle Mm -hmm. in their relationship. And so Shad decided like, I got to back off. Like, you know, this dude is big. Like if we got into a fight, he might be able to, you know, take me out. So. It's just so interesting that Deborah was still like, okay, well, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Like, that's not weird to her at all that he mm-hmm. freaked out so much and got so defensive and mm-hmm. aggressive towards him. Mm-hmm. Just odd. It's very odd. But then Deborah's suspicion started to raise a bit when one day John got a letter in the mail from the county jail and she decided to open it and start reading it. And it was from a former jailmate saying hi. <laughs> and John. What's up? Just wonder how you doing, man. Yeah, yeah. Yo, what up, man? I miss you in D b- cell block D. Like, what up? <laughs> it's not the same here without you. <laughs> but John came out of nowhere because he had been watching her on the cameras, opening his mail and snatched it out of her hand. And he got nasty with her. He was like, why are you reading my mail? Don't you know that's a felony to his wife? Like yeah. what your wife can't read your mail, bro. Like what the hell? That's pretty standard. I think And you'd think when he flipped on her like that, she would at that point be like, okay, yeah. dude, 
Well, and she did start. I mean, that was definitely like, I think one of the first yeah. big red flags for yeah. her was. So I guess she kind of did. Because his story was, oh, I'm just like helping out this dude in jail. Mm-hmm. I send him a care package. I'm his pen pal with him. Like mm, really. Just doing nice things. You're just a good person, huh? You're just doing that. But so, Deborah was like, well, how does he know you? And like, yeah. it was a, clearly a personal letter. To yeah, him. yeah, yeah. So obviously she was weirded out by it. And so the next day. John goes out to run some errands and she starts looking through some of his papers in the office. And that's when Deborah really started realizing the truth about who she had married. Let's go through the truths. Yeah. And these are just a few of them. So she found out that John was a former nurse anesthetist who was addicted to surgical painkillers, which resulted in him losing his career. Boom which that that's like a huge bomb drop Mm because you're like wait a minute yeah he is not a doctor first of all yeah but he's not even a nurse he came and practiced medicine because he's a druggy like and third of all mm -hmm. he's you know addicted to pills probably yeah yeah. so she's like oh my god Mm -hmm. does he have a drug addiction Mm -hmm. and then she started finding all these like court papers and documents about how from 2005 to 2014 which is the time he got out of prison in Michigan for drug theft to the time he met her in California and the papers were like restraining orders because he had seduced, swindled and terrorized a number of women, many of whom he had met on dating sites while posing as a doctor, um, which these court records showed, which I can't, I I wonder what that was like to just get completely uh, shocked and blown away I'm by I'm sure she was just going through stuff like oh my gosh mm-hmm. everything's going to fall apart and it, it gets real way worse like yeah. in this one he uh, John wrote quote unquote you are my project for years to come and this was to a, a woman after he allegedly suggested in an anonymous letter that he had raped her and taken photos while she was unconscious like to torment her <sighs> whether or not he actually did that I don't know but he would say things right. like this to her to scare her and yeah and makes sense why she'd take out a restraining order and in another case a 48 year old laguna beach woman said she had been recovering from brain surgery at a san diego hospital when she awoke to find john standing over her bed he said he was her anesthesiologist creepy and they actually ended up dating and she said her family had millions and he suggested she transfer money into his account to hide it from her estranged husband. And when she refused, he sent intimate photos of her to her family and wrote, you're in a way over your head on this one. Make it happen. And I walk away. If not, I will be your nightmare. So scary, dude. Terrifying. So, extortion. so obviously the police started investigating and when they searched the storage unit, they found a Colt 38 special handgun, binoculars, GPS units, ammunition, heavy-duty cable ties, syringes, a pocket saw, a bottle of cyanide powder, and eight cyanide capsules. I would think this guy was a serial killer right away. And these are all things that she's finding in these documents. And then while awaiting trial in jail, an inmate reported that John was offering $10,000 each for the murders of two detectives plus five other witnesses against him. That's insane absolutely insane it is and one of the detectives described him in the report as quote unquote a ticking bomb capable of unpredictable violence and the threat was real enough that these detectives took out a restraint requested a restraining order against him right two detectives Mm -hmm. i mean that definitely makes you worried about him yeah crazy man so as a result of all this he pleaded guilty to stalking and being a felon in possession of a firearm in February 2014. But then he got out of jail like pretty soon after and then got jailed again for violating a restraining order against another woman that he had threatened. So after getting out of jail and then going back in for violating another restraining order, he met Deborah online a few days later. And by the time he got married to her in December 2014, three separate women from around Southern California had standing restraining orders against him and at least three others had requested them. Now that's something really scary to find out that other women have restrainer yeah. restraining orders against him. You know, I'd be concerned at that point for sure. If I was dating someone that other women have had issues with, I'd be like, hmm, 
What did you do to them? What are you, what behaviors are you hiding from me? Mm -hmm. What else am I going to see as the longer I'm with you? Yeah. And imagine the fear that that created in her mind, like, Mm -hmm. especially with her sister being killed in a domestic violence incident. Like it seemed like that might be, you know, the same situation she's, she's fallen into. Yeah. Basically finding all these documents was like her worst nightmare. She found out a lot. It was like an info dump and it really freaked her out. Yeah, it did. She had to get on Anna. She had to get on Ativan for her anxiety. And then, you know, she called her lawyer right away. She's like, what do I do? And the lawyer was like, you need to cut John out of your will ASAP because then that takes the incentive to murder her potentially out of the equation. Because if he, if they're married and she mysteriously dies, like he gets Mm -hmm. all of her, her wealth and everything out. And how many Mm -hmm. cases are out there where stuff like that happens? Classic true crime case. Mm -hmm. So at least she did that. And so what John would do is he would check himself into the hospital for quote unquote back issues. But really it was just to get more painkillers because clearly he had problems with painkillers in the past and it seems like he's definitely still a user. Mm -hmm. So whenever he'd like run out, he'd go like, ah, my back, I need another prescription and he'd get them. It's crazy because you'd think that they'd have a better record of how how often he was getting them, but he seemed to kind of slip through the cracks. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. there's these bizarre cases where it's just like, we don't really know how they yeah. did it. Yeah. How they got so many, but. Yeah. And I don't think the system works as well as it no. probably should. It's probably no. easier Plus to do it. Plus he knows how to manipulate yeah, it because he's exactly. been, you know, where he works there. Right. And, so. and I'm sure when they question him about it, he has an, an mm-hmm. answer for everything. Oh, my yeah. back, I was in Iraq and blah, blah, Yeah. Right. So, You're going to deny a veteran. Right. Exactly. Yeah, totally. He manipulated people. He could manipulate anybody. Mm-hmm. So while he was in the hospital, Deborah decided that she needed to get out of the rental home. So her and her family helped her move out while John was in the hospital. And they went, and while they were moving, they actually found papers in which John had scribbled gun names, codes, phone numbers, inmate numbers, and bank routing numbers. This is really creepy. He also saved printouts from websites on which women posted warnings about scary and unfaithful men. Datingpsychos.com had devoted multiple pages to him. Wow. Here's what here's what some of the comments were. He conned me out of money. He is very persuasive, emotionally needy, slick liar. Why would you print this out? Because he get he clearly gets some sort of satisfaction, satisfaction out of this. Clearly, God. he grabbed me by the throat. Do mm. not let this man into your life. Don't be fooled by his good looks and Prince Charming personality. That's honestly like a really good way to describe him. Right. He is a parasite, a leech, an infection that festers on anyone he comes in contact with. Trust your intuition, ladies. He is pathologically rotten apple. Stay away at all costs. Classic psychopath. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine finding that on your husband? And he has it printed out and saved. (laughs) Yeah. What an idiot. God. (laughs) I know. He wasn't really that smart about it. That's why it's like surprising that this went on so long. I think maybe he just like that knew that eventually she would, they would find out like, I don't know. Like, why know. wouldn't you He's hide that? Better, hide I feel like. Well, I don't know. Like, especially if you think about like, if he was on drugs, mm-hmm. I think he was kind of sloppy because yeah. he was kind of like right. fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. totally. That's a good point. Yeah. And so she, obviously this is like freaked her out completely. So she wants to separate from John and yeah. know, kind of start the process towards a divorce, a divorce and, She's regretting that quick marriage now. Yeah, she is. And John caught on right away what she was trying to do. And Mm -hmm. he demanded that he get half of her wealth. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine you've Mm -hmm. worked your whole life and some fucker just comes in and lies to you? Yeah. uh, And and he's just like starting to threaten her about it. He's like, well, I got long lost relatives in the mob that, you know, can take care of you. Yeah. And so, yeah, they kind of had a falling out at this point, clearly. And, you know, he was like, well, if you just divide up the stuff and I'll never see you again, your choice, like you would tell her things like that. And obviously she trapped her. Yeah. Obviously, like she doesn't want to give him half no. of all her stuff. Been together for like a couple months. Yeah. Can't believe she didn't get a prenup. Like, I know you'd God. think with that much money you would that come on. Dumb. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. 
especially so fast. Well, maybe it's like, I don't know how planned their wedding was, you know, yeah. in Vegas. Was it like something they just True. went to Vegas and they were hanging out and he, he, they were drinking and he convinced her to get married that night? No preparation whatsoever. Yeah, just, that's like the, the way to do it. I bet he did. I bet he just I was like, they were too. drinking one night or something. He was like, let's go get married. Got Probably. the perfect place or he yeah. set it up or something. Probably Let her something right like to the that. altar. Probably. I mean, <laughs> Honestly. we don't really know, but... Yeah, That's wouldn't surprise me if he did something yeah. sneaky like that for sure. Mm -hmm. But while Deborah looked through his paperwork, she learned that he had a nickname, Dirty John. There's where the name comes in. Mm -hmm. So his nickname went back decades to his brief time in law school at the University of Dayton. And his classmates were the ones that called him Dirty John. And sometimes it was Filthy John Meehan or just Filthy. And, Gross. you know, it doesn't take a long time to figure out why he was called dirty john i mean clearly he's he's a ladies man he's very into you know like i can get any woman i want he's that type of guy yeah. but also he is his childhood was definitely a huge factor in mm. the way that he turned out because his dad was a professional con artist through and through mm -hmm. so he learned from a very young age how to scam people swindle people steal lie cheat Mm -hmm. and because his father did it right in front of him all the time and you know he learned from the best mm -hmm. and so he got really used to that sort of lifestyle of like you know ladies and fast cars easy money hustle kind of hustle people because right. that's what his dad would do mm -hmm. and so john in order to win legal settlements, so john in order to win legal settlements would jump in front of a corvette in order to, you know, like sue the driver or, you know, threaten to sue them and, and force them to give him like 500 bucks. He'd be like, I'm going to sue you or, you know, give me $500 right now. Yeah. And do that kind of shit all the time. Insurance scams. Or one time he'd sprinkled broken glass in his Taco Bell order. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? I'm sure people at Taco Bell are like, what? Yeah. Glass? What the hell? It's like the person who tried to put the finger in yeah, the, the Wendy's chili. Yeah. The hell? Like, how does that work? I know. I wonder if that even would work if you did try to do that. People have tried it many times at different places, putting stuff in the food and trying to make it look like. I wonder how that's even handled. Like, what the hell? I don't know. I wonder how these restaurants would investigate. I that. wonder if Taco Bell gave him any money for that. I'm sure they the did. in his Taco Bell. Good God. <laughs> but John was basically this strange lone wolf type of guy, and he thought he was smarter than anybody, and he knew he could get any woman he wanted. So that's he knew a, that he could just play the part of anyone yeah. to get what he wanted, that mm -hmm. he could just act to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. Life was a giant game to him. Yeah, it really was. It was like, who can I, you know, win over and swindle next? Mm -hmm. And this was about the time that he got married to his first wife, Tanya Sells. So Tanya Sells was actually an anesthetist nurse. And this is how John got it. Mm -hmm introduced to this field yeah because you I mean he saw oh you're get you can get, get access to drugs, some drugs. Yeah, yeah exactly so he decided to marry her and i'm sure this was a very calculated plan move of his mm -hmm. um and the two got married in dayton ohio in november 1990 and mm -hmm. at the time she was 25 and he was 31 even though he told her that he was 26 and he also told her that his name was jonathan she thought his name was jonathan for a long time and when his name's actually John. Well, which I, which makes sense. Isn't his real name Jonathan probably? No, like it's his not. His real name? name's John. Oh, so but he went by Jonathan to kind why? of throw her off. Yeah. It's and lied weird. about his age. Yeah. Those two things were. Oh, imagine like finding out that someone had been lying to you that you'd married. You found out that they actually were five or six years older mm -hmm. and had a different name. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd feel so betrayed. Oh, I know. And when they got married, John had none of his family there. He said mm -hmm. he didn't want his parents to ruin the wedding because they were addicts. Mm -hmm. So again, always had a story. But the two had two daughters actually. And Tanya helped put John through nursing school. Yeah, he actually went to nursing school and actually like graduated with a degree and everything, which is yeah. kind of impressive because nursing is no joke. Like it's not mm -hmm. an easy profession. Uh, she to helped do. him a lot. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. But they were married for 10 years. She spent 10 years with him until John decided that he wanted a divorce. And Tanya tracked down John's mother, Dolores, 
even though John had never even let her talk to her before, mm-hmm. introduce her to, to uh, Dolores before. And this was, and that's because Dolores immediately revealed that John lied about his birthday and his full birth name and that he had a drug charge against him in California. <laughs> so clearly his mom is in pretty good terms with and him. Probably, she's just like yeah, ratting him out like yeah, that. Yeah, totally, totally. She And when she called, his mom was like, I knew you'd call one day and, and yeah. I'll give you the lowdown on him. Yeah, let me tell you what a piece of shit my son is. It's not like they were covering for him or anything. But when she found out that John was lying to him about all this stuff, she started searching their house and she found his hidden supply of surgical anesthetic drugs, Mm -hmm. which she knew he had no reason to have outside of the hospital. Cause like, what the hell? Like vials of, of different types of anesthetics. They just had, he was stealing them from the hospital. Yeah. That's a big no, no for sure. Oh yeah. (laughs) So, of course, she called the police who began an investigation into John in September of 2000. So then in January of 2002, Dennis Lucan, an investigator for the Warren County Sheriff's Office in Ohio, began looking into John after hospital workers reported seeing him bring a gun into the operating room. (laughs) Another oopsie. Yeah, a major oopsie. What the hell was he doing? He's like in his scrubs with like a gun strapped in his waistband or something. Like, what the hell? So insane. Jesus. I don't know how he got through medical school and stuff. He must have like tricked teachers. And oh, stuff. I bet he steal, lied, cheat. I bet he did all sorts of crazy yeah. shit to get through college. Like mm-hmm. can't see him actually like working hard, but she said that he actually did study and stuff. Like maybe he knew the yeah. payoff would be so good that yeah. I have access to all these drugs uh, that he actually gave a shit and tried. Maybe he was smart too. I mean, the way he's conning people, he's kind of smart yeah. in a way. Like yeah. he's kind of like an evil genius in a little totally. bit in a sense. Totally. Oh yeah. Well, that's like, no, that's like the perfect word for smarter if he wasn't like doing, doing the drugs. Right. But he would also steal Demerol, which he had should have been administering to a patient. He would just take the, the drugs that were the patient's drugs. So people that were in pain, people that are recovering from surgeries, he would give them nothing or saline or something and then take their drugs. People would like get out of surgery he would be required to come give them some sort of painkiller or something. And instead of giving them the painkiller, he'd put that in his pocket and then give them fucking saline. Yeah. And they're like, I'm in pain. And he'd be like, what's your, they, they did show the good scene in the show with this whole thing. Yeah, they did where he's like standing over that woman and Mm -hmm. she's like, I'm in, he's like out of a scale of one to 10 and how much pain are you in? And And she's she's like like, 10 and he's like, Oh, okay. it's okay. I'm going to make it yeah. go away. I'll make it go away. Gives her some saline solution that walks out the yeah. door. She's like, I don't yeah. feel anything. Like, Screaming. Crazy, man. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. But obviously somebody ratted him out. And this investigator is quoted as saying, John is, quote unquote, the most devious, dangerous, deceptive person I have ever met. That's a big deal, man. So a few months later, police searched his house and they found a loaded gun and 45 empty containers for six different prescription medications. Oopsie. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's when he pled guilty to felony drug theft. But rather than surrendering to authorities, he fled the state, (laughs) checked into a hotel in Michigan where police were called because he was found unconscious, surrounded by drug vials because he said that he was going to attempt to commit suicide at this point. Wow. Um, and that he just didn't uh, measure out the correct fatal dose for the drugs that he took. Mm. And so, you know, he got taken in an ambulance to the hospital. But on the way there, he unbuckled his restraints, grabbed the drug kit, and jumped into the road. He literally jumped out of the ambulance and fucking took off. He is wild. Crazy, man. Yeah. So because of all this, John was sentenced to up to six years in prison in Michigan for resisting arrest, clearly. Yeah, he like went into a JCPenney and attempted (laughs) to jump and climb into an elevator shaft. They had to pull his ass out of there. It's crazy. (laughs) And so he went to jail and served 17 months and then was released in 2004. So John's history, even with his first wife, is just insane. It is. It's just crazy. So back to Deborah. She is clearly like freaking out. She's got to go into hiding. She's like, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he's capable of. Mm -hmm. And so she's talking to her private investigator and the investigator is telling her like, you got to 
disappear essentially you got to make yeah. yourself an extremely difficult target got to change hotels every few nights you got to always you know look around you when you go into a new place possibly wear a wig mm -hmm. blend in more because mm -hmm. deborah was very like fancy and you know looked yeah, really good all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly flashy and yeah because john's Keep in the hospital profile. yeah exactly because John's in the hospital texting her constantly, like pleading for her to come back to the hospital, come visit me. And she actually did end up going back to the hospital despite everybody telling her not to because she felt guilty about abandoning him. Isn't that wild? She, she was like, "My, I got to go back to my vows for better or for worse. <laughs> really? Even after you found out all, that he's literally a crazy psychopath? I'd be like, the vows are yeah. bullshit as soon as I yeah. found out that you are bullshit. Yeah. And everything that makes you you just was like, a lie. I just don't understand what she was thinking. Like, what she was just holding on to she this idea. She should have got annulment him. right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the second she found out anything sketchy with yeah. him. Yeah. But this was the thing about John is that he had an explanation for everything. Even for all this crazy history yeah. and criminal record that he had, he knew how to manipulate all of that in order to make himself look less bad. Like he'd be like, you know, oh, I just, you know, I didn't tell you about all this because I didn't think you'd give like an ex-convict a chance and that yeah. he pretended to be an anesthesiologist because oh, he just wanted me. to impress her because yeah. she was such an impressive businesswoman, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then everything else, he just basically blamed on drug addiction. He's like, I'm addicted to the drugs. It makes me a different person. It makes me do all these crazy things. And, you know, she she kind of bought it. Well, I mean, I guess in her defense, they do. Drugs do make you do crazy yeah. things. And they can alter your personality mm -hmm. and your mindset totally. But I think he's like rotten to the core. Yeah. Um, and the drugs just made it worse. Mm -hmm. Kind of amplified not be able to it. Think as much, yeah. and not like slow down, and he was like impulsive because of that. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Angry can make you angry and depressive. And Deborah was actually quoted as saying, "quote unquote," he always had a story. He told me that he had lied because he thought he'd lose me, and that he feels so lucky that I'm such a forgiving person. I'm the love of his life, and that I've made him a better person. Just guilt tripping him. Totally suckered I mean, her, her back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because of this and his ability to manipulate her, she moved in with him again into a new apartment yep. in Irvine. Well, and he promised he would like change, you know, not, I'm going to be better I'm for gonna you. get clean off yeah. the drugs. Right. That was the biggest thing I think mm -hmm. to her too. And he was like, I need your help. Right. I can't clean. do without you. Yeah. Like basically at my life, you make has me no a better purpose. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really like tied her to him and, you know, the only way he could be successful or better his life is if he had her in it. Mm -hmm. You know, like he'd say, like, you know, it's such a dark world, such a dark place. And if you're not in it, then, her. exactly. So after a year and three months of marriage, Deborah still had suspicions and was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with his behavior and the way that he treated her family. And the tension between Jacqueline and John got way worse. Because John didn't even want Deborah seeing her kids, especially Jacqueline, because obviously Jacqueline's like on to mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. and ha she had been so vocal about not liking him. And one day he caught Deborah sneaking away to see her and he said he'd throw Jacqueline in the ocean if it happened again. <laughs> like he'd say, Who says crazy shit, shit like, like that? that? I'm going to throw her, your daughter so in the ocean. So weird. Clearly, like, I'm going to murder her and drop her body oh in the ocean. Like, what the hell? Gosh, and why would you stay with someone who's saying that kind of crap? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is weird, too. Like, he found out that Deborah was, like, helping Jacqueline yeah. pay for her real estate classes. Mm -hmm. And so he decided to send Jacqueline some lewd messages, and including a Googled image of a pile of feces to her. It just, it's weird. I would it's like, demand yeah. my mother leave that yeah. person. I'd be like, if you don't leave them, then we have no relationship anymore. Cause that's insane. I can't, I'd be so pissed off if someone was doing that type of immature crap to me. Like someone who's a middle, like that's like a middle schooler would do yeah. that. Yeah, totally. It sounds like something a middle schooler would do, but then right? he would say shit like this. Mommy wants nothing to do with you and that will kill you. And. Oh my God. Jumping off a tall building would make me smile. Head first will work. And does she like screenshot this and send it to her mom and be like, what the actual fuck is this? Yeah. 
Yeah, she did. And I think all of these things encompassed really kind of pushed Deborah to finally, yeah. you know, file an annulment to the marriage um, after all this happened. Because clearly, like, it's getting so bad that her daughters are like, yeah. you got to choose us or him type yeah. of thing. Yeah, and he's saying that type of thing to her. Yeah, basically, like, you're threatening my daughters with their safety, like telling yeah. them that they're going to die and, and things like that. them to jump off yeah. a building. Yeah. So weird. So this is when she reaches her breaking point and, you know, she actually starts officially starts the divorce process and everything. And Deborah went and withdrew $120,000 from her bank account, hoping he wouldn't notice. And then she stashed $30,000 in the bottom drawer in a closet with stacks of hundred dollar bills that he ended up finding it and bringing it to her and being like, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. what, what's all this cash doing? What, are, why are you taking all this money out? And this is when he said, well, this isn't like not yours. You know, this is my money. Yeah. It's mine too. What's mine is yours. Mm -hmm. And then he told her to hit him. And he then said he would make sure she never got up again like threatened her after this, like clearly trying to scare her and, and be like, you know, don't fuck with me basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she was obviously freaked out and she just got out of there really quick and left. So then John ends up moving into Nevada and living in one of uh, Deborah's other homes. And he continued to start sending her threatening messages and demanding money and promising to destroy her. <laughs> He changed quick. He did. He completely flipped on her. Mm -hmm. And so she requests a restraining order, but the Orange County judge denied the request. Why? Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand why. It's not that hard to get a restraining order. I've got one on a roommate, ex-roommate. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was surprised to hear that too, that they denied the... Yeah. You think an ex... Because he said there person. was uh, no imminent threat because John what? lived in another state now and that he had never physically harmed her. So, but he made threats. I Normally, that, that's enough. Yeah, I guess I it wasn't know. enough. I don't know. I guess it depends on the judge and the state and everything. So, obviously, when the restraining order doesn't work out, she completely cuts John off and stopped taking his calls and messages. And then, this is crazy, on June 11, 2016, Deborah's Jaguar disappeared from its parking spot in front of her office in Irvine. And surveillance footage showed John stealing it, like he got into it and then <laughs> drove it away and only a block away too, by the way, and soaked it in gasoline and started a fire in it, hoping to completely like set, destroy mm -hmm. the car and set it completely on fire. But he forgot to like leave the window down so oxygen could get in and the fire just like put itself out after it started. <laughs> so there was only mild fire damage, but he clearly <laughs> did it like he pretty much stole the car but the police didn't charge him with anything they they i don't know i don't think they could like really officially prove that it was him that started the fire so they didn't actually charge him with it that's so stupid because there's proof of him taking the car and he wasn't supposed to have yeah. it like obviously he's the one who did it yeah and that I, doesn't make any sense to me i feel like you know law enforcement or the the justice system kind of failed deborah a little bit because oh, i think so both the restraining orders i think should have been issued mm -hmm. and then obviously mm -hmm. like i feel like the police should have been on him a little bit earlier on than yeah. they were and i think i mean in the show at least they portrayed that the reason that they didn't believe or they couldn't um you know charge him with anything was because he said you know i mean i did take the car yeah but it's like my car too because we're married and yeah. i was just picking it up and then i had it someone must have stole it from me and then done that and they couldn't prove him wrong there right but yeah i still feel like you know when there's video proof of someone stealing it and like with giving like, their history on, and the fact she tried to file a restraining order against him and he's stealing her car like and it's like put it two yeah. and two together here like yeah it just seems stupid as fuck but. well and i mean you know law enforcement has to have evidence in order to ch put formal charges on people and stuff right you know and if there's not a way to link him to it directly then mm -hmm. you know Obviously, circumstantial evidence is there, but there wasn't something to actually link him initially to charge him with it. But during this time, Deborah is actually living with her daughter Jacqueline um, at some apartments near the airport in Irvine. 
and you know Jacqueline moved wanted to move somewhere that was safe and secure with cameras and uh-huh. you know different levels of security to it because she was definitely in fear of of John for yeah. sure especially with all the threats he made towards her but this is when all of these things and all of these events kind of come to head here and and things just kind of get really out of control yeah um he had some type of breaking point yeah. in his own life. I think he just got he, like, completely, snapped. yeah, totally snapped. I think he just got kind of sick of this whole like game that he was playing yeah. with them and just wanted to take it to the next level. So well, I think he had major anger towards her daughters. Yes. Because felt like they were responsible mm-hmm. for tearing Deborah away from him. Right. I like he had this sure. perfect situation and like I have the perfect woman. Like if you guys didn't exist, yeah. I can my manipulate life her forever still. and, and, mm-hmm be completely fine totally Mm -hmm. totally so jacqueline called tara to warn her that john was in town so he's back in irvine from nevada and this is creepy but the previous evening jacqueline like came back to her apartment uh, and she was like in the car with her friend and she noticed that john was in a car just like outside of her apartment just chilling there like watching like just creepily doing surveillance on her pretty much and she actually like was like hey hey john like got yeah. his attention and then he took off and they actually chased him mm-hmm. in their car to try to mm-hmm. figure out you know what, what he, he was doing, doing there and confront stuff. him because her, her mom was staying in her apartment so mm-hmm. she thought john was there to kill her kill mom her. Yeah. yeah absolutely crazy i can't believe she went after him i mean that's not a good idea don't no. do that yeah, don't. call the police <laughs> yeah seriously but then she didn't just, really trust the police mm-hmm. at this point because they hadn't done anything to help totally she was just kind of like we got to take this in our own hands you know he's yeah. gonna hurt my mom i mean i would I, I would do that for my parents i'm sure any you know if you knew this kind of threat and the way that your mom has sort of reacted to everything so far it might take that sort of drastic action mm-hmm. but things all just come to an end here on the evening of august 20th 2016 Tara had returned home from work and parked her car in the lot outside her Newport Beach apartment building. And as she got out of the car, John popped out of nowhere and approached her from behind and he had a Taco Bell bag from her. And he was like, he just like walked up to her and started attacking her with this knife that he had in this Taco Bell bag, hidden in this Taco Bell bag, like as he walked up to her. And And this is Tara, not Jacqueline. The younger, like soft and sweet daughter. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the one who had less. I mean, she had issues with him too, but not like Jacqueline. Like Jacqueline and him were like, I mean, they were, he was making more threats at her and everything. Yeah. So this was kind of like surprising. Well, I think John saw her as like the easier target probably. Like, I I don't, I think he wanted to hurt Deborah, but he didn't want to actually like hurt Deborah, you know? Like, how is he going to get her attention? Yeah. And what and better way than see her in pain? Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Go after her kid. Yeah. So Tara said that he was trying to push her into the car and, and she was trying to get away from him. She was screaming and then John put his hand over her mouth and she bit him as hard as she could. And obviously this was not a fair fight at all. John's this huge six foot two dude had, you know, weighed way mm-hmm. more than Tara. Really strong too. Mm-hmm. But she fought back, man, and she was able to like get John on the ground wrestling, and she was able to um, start kicking him. She was actually wearing heavy rain boots that day, which had a thick tread on the bottom. And during the fight, like she got put on her back, and she started like bicycle kicking him. Yeah, on the ground um, because he was yeah he was trying to stab her with this knife that he had, and he man or and she managed to kick the knife out of his hand. Mm And it happened to land on her right side, which was like where her, you know, dominant hand was. So she was able to reach, grab the knife, and Badass. then immediately started just repeatedly stabbing yep. him. Just going 13 after 13 times in the back and all these different places. And then finally finished him off with a knife blow to the eye, which ended up going all the way into his brain. So picture this. There's like, he's on top of her. They're laying on the ground. He's on top and she has her hand around him, like almost in a hugging position, stabbing him, like almost like stabbing at herself. On top of her. Isn't that crazy? And then switches around, stabs him in the eye. 
like so badass. No one was expecting it from her either. Yeah. And she, she luckily, she was a, the dog groomer. So she always had her dogs with her and her Australian shepherd actually yeah. helped her during this fight and was yes. biting John's leg, actually mm -hmm. distracting um, him, yeah. weakening him. Definitely. Totally could preventing have saved him life, from arguably. overpowering her for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is, is later on, she said that she, the reason why she stabbed him through the eye into the brain is because she's a huge walking dead fan. Yeah. And I so love that. she, she like learned from the show, like in order to kill a zombie or a walker, you gotta, yeah. you gotta eventually put a, you know, stab them in the head or cut their the head, head off exactly yeah, it's the only way in order to kill them and yeah. that's exactly what she did but john or i guess just stabbing them i don't even think you can cut their head off to do it you like have to get their brain yeah you got to go into the brain out there and they'll just sit there right like <laughs> mm -hmm. but i yeah i thought that was interesting that she said that but i can totally see that and i would say something really similar too like mm -hmm. i pay attention to fight scenes too and think like oh if that's I ever had good to honestly myself, it's honestly smart like how do you, if you yeah. know how to defend yourself and yeah and i feel like obviously when you're in that situation your mind would go to like what do i what can i you don't have experience yeah. yourself you can go to like it's something you've seen or right. something and try to like totally yeah well, fight or flight it, kicks in and right. you're just like i gotta how to survive you you know he's attacking with a knife and if i don't get this knife and yeah. stop him then i'm gonna die like he's right. gonna he's gonna stab me it's really badass and that's exactly what she thought um, so actually there was a neighbor that ran over and cause she had gotten sliced really deep in her arm. He had managed to slice her uh, really good. So she was like bleeding out mm -hmm. of her arm. John's bleeding all over the place. And so her neighbor came over and like wrapped up a towel around her arm to like help stop the bleeding. And, you know, obviously called the police and the paramedics and, uh, the paramedics came and, um, basically kept John from dying right there. Mm -hmm. And then um, by administering CPR, because uh, his pulse came back. So John is still holding on to life and he's taken to the hospital. Uh, but after four days, I mean, he got stabbed in through the eye into the brain. I mean, he was basically a vegetable. As soon as he got um, in there. Yeah. Once he got to the, I mean, he was basically dead when he arrived. They put him on life support and they actually asked, um, they first asked yeah, uh, Deborah. Deborah if, you know, she wanted to pull the plug on him and yeah. stuff. And she said, no, you mm -hmm. know, you got to call somebody else. And so they ended up calling his sister who Deborah was actually ended up being friends with. Mm -hmm. And so they obviously pulled the plug on John and he died. Well, the sister days. did not like him either. It yes. turns out yeah. like his whole family hated him. Mm -hmm. So he was a complete just, yeah, they, they were like, pull it destroyed everything in his path. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a really bad person. Mm hmm. So he was declared brain dead four days after he attacked Tara. And his body was cremated and no memorial service was held. It was wow. crazy. Truly a piece of shit. Mm hmm Yeah. And that was the end of John. And Deborah, you know, after all this happened, uh, the Los Angeles Times uh, writer reporter approached her and called her about you know the podcast and you know having him write all about and stuff and and that's when she decided you know maybe this is a good story to share with others yeah. you know that might be going through something like this because obviously she's in an abusive toxic relationship um it's called mm -hmm. court uh coercive control is what it's called um type of abuse she uh, endured like john just controlled everything yeah controlled the situation and obviously he's a con man but he that's how he kind of kept her in this relationship with him for so long is mm -hmm. through this control that he had. Mm -hmm. So she felt like, you know, this is apparently a really common thing that happens. So she wanted to share her story with, you know, as many yeah. people as she could. So they did the podcast and then obviously the Bravo series uh, that's now on Netflix that you can watch that we watch. That's, Oh, so that was made by Bravo. Yeah. It was on Bravo first. Then Netflix oh, okay. picked it up. Yeah. So Netflix didn't produce it. No, no, no. It was a Bravo series. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's newly on Netflix. Though. Yeah, it is. It is. So yeah, it's Deborah. Good. Mm -hmm. I would watch it. Yeah, I'm it's definitely worth a watch. And if, you know, obviously. Eight episodes, they watch pretty easy. Uh-huh. Throw them on. Background noise, maybe. I don't know. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Acting is like, meh. But. Hey. Yeah, and I mean, if you really want to know all the nitty gritty details, and I mean, there's a lot oh, more. To the podcast. Too. The podcast is, I think, like eight episodes or something. And, you know, hour long. So eight hours worth mm -hmm. of stuff versus ours is. Mm -hmm. 
you know, an hour or two. So there's a lot more just little details. I mean, I think we did a good job of covering yeah, the basics, the basics and the major events that happened, but there was a lot, man. He was really just in it deep, man. He yeah. Just, and he dragged everybody down with him that he yeah. could. And mm -hmm. I don't know. He, Gotta be looking out ladies of, for John Meehan's like kind of like snakes karma, everywhere. karma came back around and you know, Oh yeah. He got kind bit of, him hard mm -hmm. 13 times. It sounds like, and in yeah, the eye. Yeah. And Yikes. like everybody, all of his victims were like, yeah, that's, I just think he was such a nasty person the way he talked. I don't feel bad for him at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess like in a way I do, like we were talking about this earlier, like at what point do you have sympathy for someone? We always have this conversation, like people's childhoods obviously affect them. And John had a terrible childhood and learned from his dad. And would he have been like that if he didn't have that right. experience yeah, when he was a uh, kid? I well, don't know. It's not an excuse. Certainly interesting though to think about it. Yeah. And, and I mean, it raises the question, like how much does parenting really matter in shaping who your child becomes like and, right. and what type of parent you are and what you expose mm -hmm. them to and what you teach them really has an effect on them mm -hmm. in their adult life yeah and from what we've seen in so many different criminals is that it does have a huge fact and most of these individuals they have you know family members or parents yeah. that are just as you know fucked up as they are toxic yeah so dysfunctional and chaotic childhoods lead to dysfunctional and chaotic people. Exactly. But it's just a crazy, crazy case, man. Yeah, it really is. Let us know what you think or if you've ever experienced a stalker or, yeah, or, or like a bad dating experience or, mm -hmm. or somebody, yeah. yeah, somebody you went out with that you that there was like all these red flags that started yeah. popping up for you. Like I'm, mm -hmm. sure, I'm sure somebody out there has had an oh, experience for sure. like that. For sure. But yeah, that is the story of Dirty John, man. He's dirty. He's very dirty. But hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. We will wrap it up there. We will see you guys in a few weeks in the new studio, episode oh, 100. Yes, I'm so excited to be done with the green screen. Yes, we are. I know so some of you like that. it, but we hate it. And it's really a pain. We have to record only at night and we're always tired and I hate it. I just want to. And who misses our studio. sign, man? We yes, get, we're getting our neon sign our back. Our beautiful sign. It's been so long. I know. I know. I I'm can't so wait excited. to see it again. The studio looks great. It's definitely been worth the wait. And we have some good guests lined up for yes. the year already. Yes. It's going to be a good year ahead. So stick uh, around. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you guys in a little bit. And in the meantime, we're going to be working on our big project. So yeah. look forward to that. Yep. Because it's really it's we i think yeah. you guys will like it a lot oh, oh yeah if you, you like, like this podcast. episode then you'll definitely yes. like this project we're working you will on. you will but I'm thanks excited. again for listening we will see you guys next time stay safe and stay woke <laughs>